Hello all, thank you for taking the time to listen to this recording, which is a conversation between Noah Lax, the winner of this year's Human Rights Essay Competition, and myself on behalf of René Kassan. If you don't know, René Kassan are a human rights advocacy organisation who work within the Jewish community to raise awareness about important human rights issues which resonate with Jewish experience and values, but also beyond the community, working with parliamentarians, monitoring bodies and other organisations uh, to bring about change uh, for those who are affected by these issues. We run an essay competition every year because we want to provide an opportunity to think, to engage, to read and to write about an important human rights issue. This year, in keeping with our theme for Human Rights Shabbat, the question was about genocide. Specifically, why does genocide still happen and what can we do to prevent it? The competition was judged by Lord Danny Finkelstein and the prize was £100 and a copy of the fantastic book uh, by Philippe Sands called East West Street. I will say that, conveniently, in the Zoom age, the audio quality of the conversation between me and Noah isn't fantastic, but we hope that you can turn it up uh, and enjoy what developed into a really interesting and thought-provoking conversation. I really encourage you to check out our website, www.renekassan.org. There are lots of opportunities to get involved with this type of work, and we very much hope to to, to see you involved, uh, hopefully in person, when things return to normal. And I'll also say that, as a small communal organisation, We rely on the generosity of our supporters, so if you are inclined to make a donation, you can do so through our website, and we would, of course, be very grateful to you for it. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome to to René Kassan's first ever Instagram Live. Thanks so much for being our special guest. How are you today? Yeah, I'm doing very well. I'm I'm relieved that I cleared the first hurdle in actually uh, learning how to use Instagram Live. Uh, There's a non-zero chance that my phone will either die or collapse on top of my laptop. Uh, (laughs) So yeah, two two more hurdles at least to go. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, my fingers are crossed. And um, allow me to explain why I'm, I'm so pleased to see Noah. There are a few reasons. Um, the first is that um, Noah, as I said, has, uh, is the winner of this year's uh, human rights competition. He's also a analyst in government. His views from the outset and throughout are his own and, and, and no one else's. And he's a, a past president of the Oxford Union, uh, a past a uh, Schwarzman scholar, and he's also a great guy. And um, I'm really pleased that you entered the competition and that you um, wrote your essay, which uh, Lord Finkelstein described as intellectually thrilling. Um, <laughs> it's a bit much, isn't it? <laughs> it's a beautiful phrase. Um, it's a beautiful phrase. Um, as I said um, earlier, the, the, the quality of essays was, was really fantastic, but yours really stood out. I wanted to, to know, Noah, why did you enter and, uh, and what was it like to write this essay? How did it differ from, say, an essay in a, in a university context? Yeah, so I guess, you know, my, my starting point was as follows. Uh, when thinking about genocide prevention, we normally start at that point of, um, well, why didn't the Allies bomb the Nazi train tracks? Or wh- why didn't NATO send airstrikes in moments before the Serbs would descend on Srebrenica? And, and, you know, why didn't the, the UN sort of take seriously the communiques coming from those sort of limited numbers of diplomats stayed on in Rwanda and so on and so forth? There's this this sort of kind of mythology around the last ditch intervention that never happened. Um, but it's not really good enough. You know, there's something, I think, very defeatist in the idea that we kind of, um, you know, we allow it to get to the point at which some murderous mob, whoever they are, whichever continent they're on, until the point at which they're about to engage in some massacre and it's then that we, we stamp out genocide. And, and so I think that that was the sort of the first thing I thought when I saw that that title. And, um, you yeah, know, I thought it was a great opportunity on a personal level to engage with, with a really difficult question. And, and, and I think something that, that may come out in our discussion is that there's a way in which we become desensitized, I think, a little bit to genocide because it, it's it's curricular. Right. And, and, and that sounds kind of a little bit of a paradox because I'm not saying we shouldn't learn or talk about these issues. But there, there comes a point at which when we see, you know, we get used to seeing images or we get used to certain historical narratives, it, it, we become somewhat anesthetized. So that was on a personal level, I suppose, I wanted to engage with the problem and also think about it in, in, in a kind of uh, multi-genocidal way. Of course, there, there, there have been tragically more than once. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about kind of my motivations and the kind of, mm. I guess, the motivation for the line of argument as much as anything else. And in terms of that question, how does it differ from, I don't know, writing a, an op-ed or writing an, a, a kind of, article or, or an essay at university there's something there's a freedom in, in not knowing who your audience is and i, and I think that, that that was nice about this competition right yes there was a judge but um i really felt in some ways i was writing it for myself it was my own ideas there wasn't a, a rubric or a mark scheme or 
um, or indeed a kind of a, you know viewer base. And hopefully anyone who's here will read it. But I didn't necessarily have them in mind um, at the time. So I think that there's kind of intellectual freedom in that anonymity as well. So yeah, hopefully that that's that's something of an answer to your questions there, Mo. It, it is, and, and and I'm pleased that you you mentioned uh, what was the phrase the kind of uh, multi genocidal perspective, which is a you know a horrible thing. But I, I'm pleased that you mentioned that because you know in creating this resource which accompanies the essay, um, we, we we did take a deep dive into the Uyghur issue, but. Um, our whole human rights team was trying to look at things in a more broader sense. And I think the essay uh, question, um, why does genocide still happen and, and, and what can we do to prevent it? Tried to, 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 to bring the theme and the concept of genocide um, as distinct from these um, in, incredibly difficult uh, situations. And, and, and um, I'm also pleased that you, you managed to battle through your, your compassion fatigue um, as someone who works for a human rights NGO, I, I know how you feel, and 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 and, and it's um, it's props to you for, for for looking past it and for writing this fantastic essay. Um, let me let me approach your argument and and correct me if I'm I'm misrepresenting you. I, I, as in some sense, you've already said uh, at the last minute is is too late. Even uh, you know the other day was genocide prevention day, and it might have passed you by because. The whole concept of um, uh, the Genocide Convention, which Genocide Prevention Day marks, the Genocide Convention is, is backwards looking. And so it's not particularly celebrated. Once, the, once you've identified genocide, it, 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 it's far too late. And, 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 and I think one of the reasons that your, your essay won was because um, you, you, you argued that it's about identifying the conditions which allow genocide to happen. My question is, what are those conditions? Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're tasked with stamping out the seeds of genocide, but what are the main conditions? Mm. Sure, yeah, so I think you, you kind of speak to a really important point here, is, is that we're not really talking about genocide prevention, because you're right, as soon as it's a genocide, it's, it's already happened. And so we're kind of talking about these sort of pre-genocidal conditions, which, which is obviously really challenging. Um, but the things that I, that I sort of speak to a little bit in the essay and would be happy to expand on is, you know, as follows, there are these sort of ideological condition and what I would call the functional conditions. And in the ideological space, there's there's a kind of group formation which, which imagines, um, you know, in groups and out groups. This is something we're familiar with. That's that's the essence of, of partisan politics. It's the essence of extremism. But what's different about genocidal group formation? Well, it's existential. It, it's survivalist. It's my group simply cannot survive with your group frustrating um, our every effort to do so. And, and that's sort of the first building block, I think, of the ideological component there. There's another one, which is which is key too, which is what makes that sexy, what makes that compelling. It's it's the cultural mythology. And, and I think one of the really striking kind of transnational, transcultural, transhistorical phenomena with genocide is that there's always this story. There's always this kind of resuscitation of a kind of ancient uh, kingdom or and the projection of a of a utopia going forward and and whether that kingdom is is Cambodian or whether it's a sort of Germanic folk, folklore and whether that future is 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 communism or whether that future is um, you know anything you know anything you can think of uh, it's it's something that always happens and that's I think the kind of lubricant to the kind of existential group formation um, that we see so that that's what I would see as the kind of ideological set of conditions and mm -hmm. and of course that's not necessarily um, you know, exhaustive, that there, there is more to discuss there. Um, and then there's the kind of functional realm. And I suppose these are the things we'd be more familiar with. Um, the functional realm is, is, is sort of communication and it's coercion primarily. Now, all these things, the ideology, the communication, the coercion, they go hand in hand. And, and I think one of the, the sort of scary sort of structural weaknesses we have in the world today, and, and I've had, you know, for decades really, is the existence of, let's say, one of these pillars, but not necessarily converging with the others. So mm -hmm. just a word briefly on what I mean by communicational and sort of coercive um, sort, of, uh, sort of foundations. Communications is, is simply put a kind of monopolization of, of ideas and, and the kind of funneling of a, of a singular principle uh, on mass. Now, that is not always as simple as sort of state media. That's one of the things I really wanted to, to bring home in, in the piece as well. This is not just about the kind of the, the ministry of propaganda telling you to hate your neighbor it's it's a really dialectic process it's um certainly in our world today it's, it's what people are sharing on their whatsapps it's what people are engaged with on on chan you know on various different chans it's what you're getting in your local press it's what you're getting from the state media as well in various different countries and so you have to be attuned to the kind of 
um, plurality of the kind of media ecosystem and the information ecosystem and how that can work for us and work against us. And I think what we see in, in the precedents we have in the genocides we have is a kind of convergence of these diverse pillars of that kind of communications ecosystem into a singular message. And even actually with, with the Nazi Holocaust, right, there's, yes, there's a big state and there's a kind of state-backed propaganda effort, but there's also, you know, pe po popular cultural figures playing their part. There's this sort of, you know, the, the film, the filmmakers and, and, and the actors and, and the singers who, who play a role too in, in actually making what would, would otherwise be maybe a dry political narrative something that has traction among mm. the masses if you will and you know it's not a great phrase but you know you see where i'm going with that and then there's the coercion and this is the point that's most obvious because normally when we get to that point it's too late um i guess what i want to say in the essay contrary to what i've said at the start of this talk about you know always kind of humming and hawing that we kind of miss that final moment is that no there is a final moment but it's not necessarily always mm. the one we're thinking of it's for me that moment where um the the, the aggressor the belligerent um you know the proponents of genocide um push that button that they've not pushed before mm. um that they, they do that final test um and then we, we ignore it and then the rest is history and, and then we have to have these kind of conversations so yeah mm. to bring it back you asked me what those conditions are they're ideological they are communicative they are um they're coercive and and when they converge uh it's it's a really really serious problem yeah, I, I appreciate you making reference to those moments, which we will get, get onto in a sec. Um, and, and, and I'm grateful to you for setting out um, the theory. Allow me to try and um, ask a question which um, tries to, 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 to bring a, a, a specific case and, and, and trying to, to, to merge both of those uh, ideological and, 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 and functional um, <clears throat> uh, uh, pillars, as it were. One of the things, one of the functional elements you, you, you made reference to were, were, were the vectors for violent incitement, which, which go beyond uh, state propaganda. And one of the solutions that you suggested was, was making tech companies um, accountable to independent bodies. And, 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 and I see that very much as a kind of functional um, element. Uh, but of course, this relates to, to, to hate and, 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 to, and to the incitement of violence. And, and I wanted to know whether you thought that um, these efforts that we take on the functional side um, whether we can stamp those out uh, in, in their entirety or whether there is something about this reoccurrence in history of these ideological uh, phenomena which mean that you know there may well be bits that uh, um, that slip through the gaps almost yeah i think that's again it's a it's a deep question because i suppose what you're saying is uh, there's something also defeatist about saying you know let's just mitigate it. Why not be in a place where we don't even have a problem to mitigate? So yeah, totally. I'd much rather be in a, in a, I'd much rather be able to argue, here's what we can do to quell hatred rather than be in a position saying, oh, well, here's how we're going to sort of turn the tap off further downstream. Uh, I would still stand by the kind of uh, need to do both um, because I do think like maybe there's a kind of sinister inevitability that, that there will be, you know, various different uh, hateful actors. But yeah, you're right. There's more that can be done to, I think, quell that hatred at source. And, and a couple of things I've been thinking about, right, because we're, we're very familiar with, with that kind of pro-integration arguments or education arguments, or, oh, here, you know, read a textbook or like, you know, have a pen pal from this other culture or, oh, you know, th this will definitely sort you out, right? You'll, you'll, you'll be less of a racist if you, if you read this book or, or make this friendship or play football in a team that's mixed Israeli and Palestinian, like, you know, fine, great, like, do that. But I think there's there's sort of two assumptions in, in all of these kind of um, programs, which is that firstly, people are able to see themselves in a kind of hateful uh, context. And secondly, that we need somehow to understand the essence of, of somebody's kind of cultural identity to not hate them. And my view is basically that it's really understanding the banality of other people that makes us not hate them. And let me explain. Mm. I, I think we, we construct other people um, through stories, because that makes sense to us as, as humans, and those stories can be uh, very, very flattering, and those stories can be very, very hateful. Um, but, uh, you know, the more we can understand other people as, you know, basically they eat and they, they do all the stuff that we do, and they, you know, have a kind of very, very banal existence, and the, mm. the more we can kind of, I think, just see them on a level that we see ourselves, uh, mm. which doesn't involve some kind of, like, cultural affectation or fetishization or anything like that, the better so that's number one okay you can mm -hmm. ask me how we get there but that's just part of that, <laughs> that was my next question actually yeah <laughs> uh, but just the, the second point i want to say uh, in addition to kind of understanding the banality of other people in order to not mm. hate them um is seeing yourself in the context and I, one thing that always amazes me is 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 how very very racist people 
um, don't understand that they can be a racist. And they can also be comfortable saying that other people are racist as well. You know, that mm. nobody, obviously no one wants to be a racist because it, it, it's not particularly appealing nowadays as an identity. But I do genuinely believe people have a fundamental problem with, self, with self-awareness with self on these kind of issues. They mm. can easily see problems around them, but they can't see that they are part of that problem. It can't possibly be me. I'm, you know, let's take anti-Semitism. I can't possibly be an anti-Semite because anti-Semites, you know, are skinheads and they wear leather boots and they've got swastikas and they've got tattoos of, of you know, Nazi insignia. No, no, that's not me. That's not me. And, and you know, mm. rinse and repeat for, for very, you know, let's take anti-black racism in, in the US, right? Oh, no, I can't be a racist because racists wear white hoods and, and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think there's there's a, a self-awareness problem that, that we have, a fail a failure for everyone to recognise that, that they do mm-hmm. play a role in all of this. So taking those two sort of a, as a very, very foundational element of, as I say, number one, trying to understand the banality of other people to, to, to mm-hmm. kind of not love them, but be indifferent to them, because let's be honest, that's what we're going for here. Um, mm-hmm. And number two, uh, to sort of, you know, just um what was i saying uh yeah basically I, i'm rambling but you, you get the point i'll let you ask your second question I, now I, I, I do and and you've actually made me uh change my approach because i was uh, gonna ask you know where do i need to stand and which mosque should i go to to try and build up the relations with our with our, our neighbors from different communities to ensure that the bonds are there to prevent any of these uh conditions which allows genocide to happen but now i've i i i, I take your point about um uh uh, some psychological process taking place and before I ask a question uh, which is fantastic which my colleague Jesse has popped in the uh, in the in the chat um, I want to ask this which is uh, the psychological process uh, to which you make reference uh, at the, the development we need, all need to have both in how we understand the self and how we understand the other uh, let's 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 um, double click on that as it were we want to in your essay you mentioned uh, information literacy and, 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 and critical thinking skills, presumably at a young age. Uh, are there any other methods come to mind for you in terms of trying to move us along from, uh, uh, it, 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 in terms of our understanding of the self and of other? Mm. Yeah, so I think just to, to, on that point of information, on that point of sort of critical thinking, um, I, you know, I refer to that very specifically in the context of um, media consumption mm. um, and you know, I don't necessarily think that critical thinking makes you less racist at all, actually. And um, we've seen, actually, there's v- very, very proficient racists who are very well educated. I'm talking more specifically about kind of people's receptiveness to conspiracy theories, people's receptiveness to to misinformation and disinformation, mm. uh, mm. which I see as particularly important in the kind of modern world as, as a vector for potential genocide or ethnic violence or political violence. Mm. And we have enough sort of modern precedence for that so so when i invoke critical reasoning and, and information literacy it's very much in that kind of context of media landscape mm. um so you know in terms of what else we can do in that sort of that sort of psychological sphere of you know self-knowledge seeing where you are in the problem you know seeing as i say like that other people are but now what else can we do yeah i i think you know in education is helpful right education is is important and i think we need to actually really be learning about racisms and genocides and all of that but it's Mm. it's almost um it is literally academic unless we're able Mm. to make a link between between that those stories and and our sort of present conditions and Mm. and i think that that's really really important now it's a really fine line because you also want just neutral scholarship you also want uh people that approach Nazism as historians and colonialism as historians, right? Not everything is about um, sort of uh, sort of uh, instilling a, a present or future generation with, with moral credentials. Um, mm. So it's it's about kind of finding that balance, I think, between an education which somehow fails to make a connection to to our contemporary sort of uh, world, but also not going too far so that we kind of subvert, I would say. Um, academic approaches to be instrumental always to to kind of ideologies even if they're moral ideologies so yeah I, I think I'm not I don't want to do away with education I just I think particularly when we're when we're in school right when we're in we're in primary school when we're in we're in secondary school mm. let's not pretend like our curricula are, are kind of neutral they are instilling something and we have to really make sure that that when we're learning about stuff we have a we have a kind of contemporary sense of why that matters. And that's true for, for positive stories as well. That's true for kind of uh, reinforcing a sense of identity wherever you may live and uh, whatever culture you may be part of. So I think making that link, that, that link between kind of historical circumstances and, and present conditions is really, really key as well to, to kind of, yeah, as you, as you put it, 
um, developing a, a sense of self and other that is that is not sort of existential and and, mm. uh, and kind of fatalist. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And 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 my hope is that uh, further down the line, uh, we'll we'll log back into Renika Sands Instagram and, and and have a look at, at this moment and uh, and the steps which needed to be taken. You know, in all of us to to bring us closer to, to to a situation in which those conditions don't exist. Allow me to to, to pull us back slightly to a, a fantastic question which was asked, and and I, and I hope that it. Uh, uh, I hope that it, it makes sense, despite the uh, uh, despite the, the things that we've been saying. Uh, Jesse asks, uh, with respect to what you were saying about uh, banality, she says, is that based on the theories of Hannah Arendt and the idea of the banality of evil? That's something which has been difficult across the board, the idea that such evils can be done by regular people. So, yeah, I guess that's the flip side to what I'm saying. But but really where this point comes from, my idea about, uh, it's not my idea, but the idea I'm expressing about kind of understanding the banality of people's humanity in order not to hate them comes from uh, the, uh, I'm thinking about the Uyghur issue and I'm thinking about mm. how uh, there's a great line in, I think it's, uh, it's one, the Nick Hol Holdstock book about Uyghurs, um, China's Forgotten People or something, where you know mm. he says that in China, and this this is a book, by the way, published in about 2014 or something. This is before the excesses, contemporary excesses, but still, uh, you know, very much at a time uh, of, of very severe uh, repression. And there's a line that, you know, Uyghurs were either conce conceived of as sort of dancing minstrels, uh, you know, by Chinese in Chinese media, or if not dancing minstrels, kind of thieves and crooks and, and terrorists and that sort of thing. And and I think that really speaks to a uh, this sort of kind of double edged. Um, you can call it fetishization, or you can call it kind of a storied version of an of an outgroup that we are so used to kind of um, constructing for our own understanding often. And and it's not good enough just to see, let's say, another culture for for the songs and for the for the dances because actually the flip side of that is something equally kind of um well something sort of inversely nefarious and mm -hmm. so that's why i kind of want to get away from from the idea that the way to p hate people less is to understand their festivals and, and to understand and to appreciate their cultural output i think that's very convenient because we get to enjoy that without mm. necessarily doing the hard work. So that that's why I'm stressing banality. Like I think Hannah Arendt is a really is of course a really important person to talk about in the context of of totalitarianism and in the context of, of therefore, you know, genocide. Um I think the banality of evil is almost I think is is consistent with what I'm saying, which is that just just as you know, you can hate somebody, uh, you, you can resist hating someone because they're banal. So to, you know, people can hate and be very banal. The, the baseline mm. is people are banal. And, mm. uh, and I, I think that that's, that's just what we should be going for. We should understand people on, on a kind of common humanity, as cliche as that sounds, but it's less cliche when you think about it in the context of how else we've tried to, to understand other cultures by sort of, as I say, basically fetishizing them or vilifying them. Yeah, I appreciate that you you you, you have in a, in a way put your finger on one of the challenges about communicating and educating as a, a non Uyghur about the Uyghur issue because we don't want to make it all about genocide, but we also realise that uh, you know the Jewish community and and the Uyghur community's relationship, uh, unless you go uh, unless uh, you look at Bukharan Jewish history, is it, it, one which is is quite new and and, and so well, as a, as a community organised, it is a challenge uh, um, and. You know, every time we present and every time we, we share something, we realise that someone is going to take something different from it, and and and, and some degree, some degree, that fetishization is is beyond our control. Um, but before, uh, in fact, instead of asking you whether you agree with that, I want to bring in uh, the comments of Lord Danny Finkelstein, uh, which is the first time I brought in uh, a lord uh, before. He said this about the essay: he "said the author is very much of the same mind as my grandfather, Alfred Weiner." Dr. Wiener was one of the leaders of German Jewry in the 1920s and 30s, and later the archivist of the anti-Nazi effort. Uh, his view was that central to combating fascism was understanding it. Uh, I wanted to, to bring us onto this issue by asking you, um, do you think that we're doing enough? Uh, do you think that we're, we're doing Dr. Wiener proud and, 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 and taking the uncomfortable steps to understand uh, fascism and racism for the purposes of combating it? Or do you feel like we, we may have allowed our uh, ourselves to, to 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 be too quick to outrage and disgust and 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 and, and, and disengagement. Uh, big, it's a big question. I mean, look, I I think I w I'm not the first person to to talk about the fact that I think you know fascism is is often a term that's used with with a kind of uh, I don't know uh, an undiscriminating kind of uh, readiness. Uh, not everything that is bad is fascist. Things can be bad and not be fascist and be bad for their own reasons. So I, I do think there's a, there is a way in which we have lost understanding. 
But I also think there's a need to not necessarily understand our contemporary challenges in the context of historical phenomenon. And, and I know we've talked about education and linking it to the present, but uh, yeah, I, I do question the kind of utility of, of, of trying to see the extent of our contemporary crisis by seeing where it falls on the kind of fascist spectrum. I think, you know, our, our political polarities are, are, are very much changed um, in a kind of, um, you know, banal sense, whether we're talking kind of left, right, um, or indeed when we're talking on the kind of extremes, like the extremes have changed just as the, as the kind of centre or mainstream has changed as well. So I think the question is not really, shouldn't necessarily be like, you know, do we understand fascism? And, and if we don't, like, are we veering off a cliff, a fascist cliff? And what I would say instead is that, no, we could be hurtling towards a cliff, but it could be something, it doesn't have to be fascism, because mm. the fasc a lot of fascists have got pretty good at not being fascist. They've restyled themselves because it's not as trendy anymore to, to it was mm. fascist, the sort of, easily forgotten thing about fascism was that it was extremely exciting you know it was sort of you know this this zeitgeisty um futurism is is, is one yeah. of the kind of uh, intellectual movements linked to fascism and that says it all really so um you know i think of course it's going to be something new that 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 presents the challenges in the contemporary setting um mm. in terms of racism you know i think it, you know when i was writing about genocide i was thinking less about racism and thinking um more about um you know, the kind of the bigger ideological frameworks and, and the bigger kind of, um, you know, communication mechanisms. And as we've discussed, the kind of coercive practices that, that so often go unchecked. And so mm -hmm. I, I think racism is, is, is sort of, uh, it's granular within that. Um, and perhaps, you know, not, not, not best place to talk about it for that reason. And I, I also think it's really possible to be involved in genocide and not be a racist. And I think that's a really key point too, because so much of genocide is, is about complicity or inaction sure. or kind of, as, as I discussed before, this ability to extricate yourself from a process that is ongoing, that you are, are a part of, but you don't see yourself as a part of it because of this kind of um, rationalization effect that, that we do, by the way, even, you know, if we accidentally steal something, we tell ourselves, oh, it won't matter, you know, so too, I think this is something that happens in, in kind of political atrocity. So, you know, I, I think in some ways, uh, fascism is, is not necessarily relevant, as controversial as that sounds. And racism is, is also not the place to focus in this conversation about genocide. It is a thing to focus mm. on for all kinds of important reasons. But, sure. but it's, 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 it's an auxiliary to genocide rather than its engine, I think. I understand. I understand. I, I, I appreciate that. And, 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 uh, and we'll think about it carefully. And um, w w w one of the, uh, one of the um, outcomes of, of, of that position of yours, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we need to be more alert than ever. Because it, as it comes, it may well look quite different to how it's looked in the past. And, and Unfortunately, we lost Noah here for a second. But I'm asking him, what are the real life indications when the conditions necessary for genocide have actually developed that states are willing to tolerate or enact genocide? In his essay, he wrote that states reveal their cards and test the boundaries and that when we're blind to the hands, we invite violence. I'm asking, him, what are those hands? What do they look like? Yeah. So, you know, I think my, my answer would be on, on what, what what the kind of reveal is on China's part. It's intuitively it, it's about, oh, maybe locking people up. Oh, maybe, you know, demolishing mosques. Oh, maybe uh, reports of sterilization. Oh, you know, maybe reports of slave. No, that that's not what I'm going to refer to. For me, the, 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 the most horrifying thing is the total sort of indifference that that ostensibly China has to those things being out there in the world. Now, I, I don't think for one minute China would, I think China would prefer that we didn't know those things. But the fact that we have seen nothing by way of kind of uh, adjustment to those policies, yes, some some very, very superficial kind of changes at, at one point, but the, the kind of sense of which the sort of collective shrug, right, of, okay, mm. you know, not only are we gonna, not only are we not going to do anything, even though mm. you now all know about this and have the satellite images, <laughs> but we're also going to get a bunch of countries together you know, and, and think politically how this looks because they happen to be Muslim countries and get them to sign something that says mm. this is all hunky dory. You know, this sort of wanton, wanton mm. kind of um, impunity and, and self justification for all of this. The, the fact that with all of this evidence, the narrative is nothing to see here. And oh, if you do see it, it's justified. Look, a bunch of Muslim countries said it's fine. Like that for me is, is I think, most horrifying because at least, and this is really, we're really scraping the barrel here. At least when people do terrible things, when they deny it, there's a small part of them that knows it's terrible. Because if they didn't know it was terrible, they wouldn't de deny it. I think that takes us back mm. to what we were saying about racists, like, you know, racists who don't understand that they're a racist. At least they understand conceptually that racism mm. is bad. 
But trying to imagine a situation, you know, and we have this in sort of more extreme ends of, of racism and indeed the more extreme excesses of state brutality, where actually there isn't even a kind of denial there, there, or a kind of moral justification. It's just like, yeah, this is it. And like, we don't mm. care. And I think well, that for me is, is, is what's so horrifying. And uh, yeah, so did you want to jump in with a question? I was going to say, to what degree do you think that impunity is uh, uh, brought forth from their belief that we really need their cotton? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's bigger than cotton, right? I think it's I think cotton is probably uh, the, the smaller part. I think that, that there are other aspects. Ch China is is a kind of take it or leave it option in terms of um, how I think it it will present itself often to countries. In that, um, I think there are a number of um, you know relationships between countries that are complicated, where where people get together on on one issue but diverge on another issue uh, that that's you know the essence of diplomacy and I, I think china would like to make that quite hard i think china would quite like to be in a position where it says um look you, you accept the, the terms of, of how we're going to think about taiwan um mm. and then you get this trade or you know you, you accept what we're doing in hong kong and then you know you you get us to come to the table on this issue so it, it's and of course other countries do this as well right it's uh, it's not just china but the point is that um you know, I, I think it's China is well aware of the leverage it has on across the board. And so it doesn't have to be manufactured goods from from Xinjiang. It can be manufactured goods from totally the opposite coast. It can be the stock, you know, the mm. stock market in Shanghai. All of these things are, are chips in, in a kind of, uh, you know, international discourse. And yeah, China knows that. And, and it's thrown its weight about in other ways on, on actually way more trivial issues. And, and my favorite example is, is probably when... Um, I think there were a number of US airlines back in 2019 or 2018 that, that had listed on their websites that um, that Taipei was in Taiwan, which it is, but you know, from the Chinese perspective, Taipei is in China. Um, right. Taiwan is, is China. So uh, then the, the Chinese government sort of threatened sanctions on, on these US airlines. And by the way, we're not talking about like the US equivalent of, of, of like, um, you know, Thomas Cook. Like we're talking about like Delta and like American Air, like the main US airlines uh, mm. were basically threatened with sanctions from the Chinese government for what they listed on the website. So cotton, I think, is also, uh, it's a sideshow. Uh, there, there's a bigger mm. picture of, of how we engage with China. And, and actually, my ideal, I think, would be to be able to engage with China where we, we take, you know, we engage on X issues and we diverge on Y issues. Um, but I think what mm. we're seeing is a, is a kind of um, a divergence where it, we, we have one camp that kind of now believes the only option is like this total decoupling or, or um, you know, another camp, which is sort of like, ah, well, you know what, like America invaded Iraq and that wasn't great, you know, and China's got lots of money. So, so crack on, you know, so I, I think these are, these are neither of which are particularly viable, but look, I'm aware this is becoming a bit of a geopolitical discussion and I'm not so <laughs> I enjoy it. And it's for that reason that I've lost track of time because I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for your, your fountain of knowledge and, and, and I'm learning, but I do need to bring us back. And, and, and although we should have finished five minutes ago, I want to ask you one more question, which mm. is that, um, the cruel, one of the elements of cruelty of this essay composition was that you were limited to 1,500 words. And uh, mm. I'm sure you, you, you had to cut it down. And I wanted to know, uh, we've spoken about many things um, over the course of the past half an hour, but, but what would you have included? What topics, which elements would you have liked to include if, you, if it wasn't limited to such a short uh, essay? Mm. Yeah, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, I would have liked to use more case studies um, because I didn't talk about Armenia. I didn't talk about Darfur. Mm. I didn't talk about other things as well. You know, it's... There, depending on how you want to define genocide, there are a whole manner of, uh, of, of case studies you could include. And, and, and I think there's a richness to understanding informed by, um, you know, just the plurality of case studies and, and mm. also differences, which are important. So I, I think I would have I've tried to diversify and, and expand that kind of case file. And that's number one. I think number two is, and, and some of your questions have sort of lent into the kind of, so how do we fix it? I, I would have liked to devote a much more thorough section to the kind of fixes. I was mainly able to speak in a kind of high level terms. Once I'd given a taxonomy of like how genocide happens, I didn't have much space to say, sort of say what we do about it. So I think, yeah, and like part, part B would have maybe been a, a bit of a reflection on, on, on other sort of tragic instances. You know, the Yazidi one was one that I, I toyed with kind of tragic include because it's so um, kind of, so very little is known about it. It's so recent. Uh, indeed, as well, the, what's happened to LGBT people in Chechnya, this sort of thing. Right? The, I would like to include those things. And second to that, I would like to maybe add a bit more uh, substance around uh, what we do about it. But that, that, that's, that's maybe for, for next year's competition. I, I agree. And I, I, I'm grateful that you would point towards uh, the way in which my questions have tried to be hopeful in, in the context of, of a very difficult uh uh, topic, uh, but we've decided to take it on anyway. You know, we're we're a, we're a hope and value-based organisation, and so it's been a challenge to to communicate to people of all ages 
uh, about this issue um, you've helped over the course of the past 37 minutes. Um, I, 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 I will hope that we can uh, speak again both in a Rene Kassan context and, 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 and outside. Let me just point um, anyone who's uh, still uh, listening to us uh, how they can get further involved. I've suggested that there are ways that you can uh, contribute uh, to uh, the prevention of genocide. I stand by that. One of them is to uh, put pressure on your local MP with respect to the Uyghur issue right now. Uh, movements are happening in Parliament, which you can read about on our website. Uh, now is the time to, to, to write and to, to throw your hat in, into the ring. The other is that, as I've mentioned many times, we've spent time creating this resource, which is supposed to educate, but also um, incite thought and discussion on the topic of genocide, which is also available on our website. Uh, although we have just gone into tier three, and so I, I would uh, advise this only when appropriate. There are protests um, in London and elsewhere um, on the Uyghur issue. And, um, and, and although we stopped short of, 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 of advising this in our discussion, building those barriers and, 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 and making those connections uh, with people who, who we're not familiar with is, 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 is may not solve the issue, uh, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. Um, thank you so much for joining us, um, Noah. You're uh, a fa fabulous interlocutor. I'm grateful for your Monday evening. Um, I'm looking forward to chatting to you again in due course. And thanks to everyone who's uh, joined us. As the uh, Rene Kassan slogan goes, stay helpful, stay hopeful, and stay human. And uh, yeah, make sure to share this video. I very much hope to uh, see you on IG Live again soon. Thanks. Thanks so much, Marissa, and thanks everyone else. Bye.